Thank you for coming along this evening. Um, I wanted to say also thank you uh, for to to Edge Hill for uh, the continued collaboration. I think it's it's a really important uh, partnership um, which is contributing uh, to take the report. But also, I think there's a sort of shared sense in which we both we both I think both Tate and Edge Hill make. Liverpool and the city region a better place to sort of live and it really contributed to a sort of a living culture. I wanted to just sort of talk qu quickly about a show that we're installing right now which is Fernand Fleger. We're opening three shows on the 22nd of November. There's going to be a big launch party. It's an open invitation so please come along. Uh, I believe there'll be a free drink I think to um, for the first um, for the first arrivals. Just quickly uh, Fleger He's a sort of French artist. He was born in 1881 and died in 1955. And he really, he's the epitome of this sort of modern artist. I think he was somebody who was belonged to a circle of intellectuals in Paris around 1900. He was, um, he was an architect. I mean, I think he really, he really epitomised a certain like modern ideal. He was an art, he was a painter primarily. He w was responding to the sort of um, the rise of m the modern age and the machine age. Second. Machine Age, the Metropolis. He worked in film, painting, architecture, uh, uh, textile design, stained glass. Um, uh, but he was also very political. He was somebody who was working. He was he, he was uh, he made work in response to the First and Second World War. He was a member of the Communist Party from 1945. He was a lifelong socialist. He came from a very rural family, um, and I think, without being too cliché, I think he had one foot. I mean, he was sort of a people's artist. One foot on the factory floor, one foot in the art gallery. And really, he really believed that uh, that modern art shouldn't be exclusive, it should be made accessible and meaningful and, av av and available to all in society. And, and I think hopefully you can see, you can see, you can see, you can see that in the show. Uh, as I said, as, as Ray said, it's a paying show, uh, but it will be free to the students of, of Edge Hill University. And that opens on the 22nd of November. So should we get, get on with Op Art in Focus, which you are supporting? Great. Thank you, uh, Darren. Um, I wanted to kick off, really, with a quite an obvious question in terms of what actually Op Art is. It's, I think it's often thought of as a, as a movement in the historical timeline of, of sort of art history. But I'm wondering, it's not, it's not technically a, a, a movement in its own yeah. right. Just exactly. Oh, I think. I think. I mean. I think Tate always tries to sort of. I mean, we're, we're sort of, sort of m m moving away. I think from sort of categorizing, you know, ha ca you know, artists by by being. But I think op art really is more of a tendency. I think it was a kind of tendency, and that um, that um, that was a tendency in the 1960s, um, and it was coined by the American sculptor Donald Judd in 1964. And really, op is an, an abbreviation of optical art. It's 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 it's, it's, um, it's, um, it's this it's the um, it's use, it's using sort of optical effects to create visual uh, turbulence and psychedelic effects and visual inst instability through through bold contrasting colours and repetition, line interference, dazzle effects. Um, I think op art. I mean, it was uh, it was um, it was the first op art show was, if you can call it that, was um, in, in 1955 in Paris. But then there was a major show at MoMA in the mid 1960s in, um, that was called that was called the Responsive Eye, and included artists like Br Br Bridget Riley and Peter Sedgley, who was sort of Br 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 British experiments of, of optical art. Um, and but I think optical experimentation. In art, you know, sort of dazzle effects. You can see, you can see this is this is Jim Lambie. It can really be traced back to things like pointillism and Seurat and divisionism, and also uh, bits of kind of futurism, the sort of the dazzle effect of of the Gavorticists and Wadsworth, and those that that sort of that very that visual aggression um, that you can see, that, you know, really in response to the First World War, I think. Um, yeah, but I think op art really it was a sort of tendency. And a, and a style, I think, which emerged in the 1960s. Okay, because it fell on quite closely to um, to the constructivist um, artwork as well, didn't it? I think that it the nature from sort of Bauhaus. And yes. And those sorts of things. Yeah, I mean, I think the show. I mean, I think it's. I'm looking for the images here, but I think um, the show isn't really op art. I think it was. Um, it was a kind of. It's more about. It's trying to. F it's, tr it's suggesting a different relationship. So w one of the artists. On display is Joseph Albers, who's not an op artist, and actually he didn't claim to be an op art. But 
but there's something. But he was somebody who was very associated with the Bauhaus, um, and he was interested in this very um, rational, you know, a very sort of rational sense in which somehow um, uh, design influenced art. That you could create, you can create, you can create this c compulsive use of the square, and you could create sort of slight variations in colour to create spatial ambiguity. Um, so he was somebody who was that that sort of very design very rational approach to visual composition um, I think is sort of interesting an artist you know artist like kind of like kind of like Carol Jolly is really an American minimalist artist and he coined the term in no sense can we say Carol Judd was not artist but you know he was in the mid 1960s his girlfriend was Yayoi Kusama who who is you know that sort of um, obsessive um, sort of retinal overstimulation you see in her in in her installations in her, in, in her works, and Judd was helping her to make those works, those um, those infi those infinity networks in the 1960s. So there's, I think he was trying to su suggest that there's a different way of, of, of linking optical or op art, as we understand it, Vasarely, Bridget Riley, and the um, and, and, and his artists is something like Donald Judd and minimal art and post minimal art and contemporary art also. I think that's, that's hopefully what you can see in okay. in the display. Great. Um, I was just wondering uh, is the, the visual impact of up art is, is very dynamic, and I was wondering uh, how how that work would have been seen in, in the 1950s and 60s. So perhaps part of a broader cultural yeah. uh, scene. Yeah. If you could expand on that at all. Well, I think it's. Um, it's sort of simple. I mean, Albert's here. I think of. Um, I think it's sort of. I mean, I think op art is. Um, it's a. St it's a. St a st 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 it's a style, I suppose. I mean, it's sort of symptomatic of a kind of social energy. And to me, I think it's the cliche is that it's sort of symptomatic of of acceleration and post-war optimism in the 1960s. There's, there's a kind of a sp sp space age aesthetic, I think, mm. um, and it was something. Um, and you know Bridget, you know Bridget, Bri 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 uh, Bridget Riley herself was very. Um, I think although she's an op artist, I think she seemed to spend an entire career sort of trying to move away because because I think because of its um, its machine made look, it was very. It was also manif if it was e it was easy to, to find a manifestation in in the applied arts and wallpapers and graphics. Um, and somehow you think you, if, if 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 you look at kinetic art and op art now. It seems to it seems very sort of time capsuled. I think in the nineteen sixties, I mm. think um, as being somehow an evocation of you know the relationship between t technology and perception and the space age, um, you know, and high tech in the nineteen sixties. It's a slightly sort of time capsule sort of um, st um, st style. Um, um, so, uh, and as, as I said, I think it was. It was it was it it was manifest in wallpapers and graphic design as well. And I think I think I was reading when Bridget Riley went to M M MoMA. I think she was ho horrified to see, you know, her her um, her painting simply like re re reproduced as textiles. And you know, and, and she you know, and I think one of the questions you mentioned about you know. Um, you know, maybe it wasn't taken seriously. Mm. It, it, you know, it, it had this. It was. T it, it had too much of a proximity to the applied arts. But I think, to me, that's why it's interesting. I mm. think the fact that it wasn't. Um, it had a sort of democratic, open-handed application that it could be linked to pointillism and surat and, if, you know, easel painting at, at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, but also becoming become some somehow part of popular culture and a popular style in, in the 1960s okay perhaps if we, if we keep on some of on those some of those um, themes then looking at the um, I mean Clement Greenberg talks about uh, our part as being he, he coins it as being a novel sort of novelty art um, lowbrow low or yeah. certainly midbrow and uh, there's it, it, it a feeling that at that time Certain critique, critical uh, writers were s seen op art as not not a critically critical worthy subject. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's, there's, a, there's a balanced argument now. I wonder if you could put that in some sort of context in terms of a where where it was at the time uh, in terms of uh, critical uh, alignment, and but sort of b is that has that sort of changed slightly over the years? Has been seen a bit more yeah. 
weighty as this time has gone by? Yeah. Well, I think Clement, I mean, Cl Cl Clement Greenberg would have been writing, you know, he was very much um, associated with a previous generation of, of, of artists. He was, um, you know, he was, a he was an experiment of sort of c c colour field painting and abstract expressionism. So something about the sort of the, the genius or four year expression on, on, uh, on the canvas and um, and he would have, I think I'm sure he would have regarded up art as being kitsch and sort of, you know, mm. too, too mass culture. Um, so I don't know if Clement, I mean, I, I think I, I, I wouldn't expect Clement Greenberg to, to have, exp to have or, you know, to have um, been a champion of Bridget Riley. Um, but I think there were a number of, I mean, there, there were a number of artists, I mean, if you look at the artists like Frank Stella as well and that um, sort of machine made aesthetic, um, sort of in Industrial painting and minimal. I think there's, there, is, there is a relationship between op art and that sort of pr the optical overstimulation, the sort of um, the, the machine made that sort of pl pl plastic quality, the use of sort of plastics and synthetic media to make sculptures and, and p p p p p paintings, which doesn't look like it's being made by a human being. It's just sort of machine made, um, a minimal art. Um, the high tech thing. I think there was something. I think there were a number of art. I mean, it's it's not related to like pop art, really. I, sp I suppose and Roy, Roy Lichtenstein and the mm. use of bende dots and you know, which again is linked to pointillism. But it's, there's something. There's a kind of retinal overstimulation in those works too, and the, you know, the sort of jarring colour combinations and a very reduced, refined sort of pop palette in, a, the, in, in those works. Um, so it wasn't. You know, I think it would have been, and I was, I was going to talk about Signals as well, which is um, a gallery which existed um, Wigmore Street in L L London in, in the mid 1960s. And Signals was um, a really important <coughs> gallery in London. Um, it was run by Paul, by Paul Keeler and Guy Brett was involved, um, and it really I mean, it really internationalised. Um, the London art world at a time, you know, it was the same time as people like Robert Fraser and um, Indica, um, uh, I suppose a, a little bit later. But Signals was, um, it introduced Latin American art. So Jesus Soto was a, a, a Venezuelan artist. Mm -hmm. he, would, he, he was showing at uh, Signals. He's in the op art display mm -hmm. that we, we, ha we have here. But they, one of the one of the sort of missions of signals was to sort of forge a relationship between technology and science and you know progressive thinking and and, and the art. So there's, there was something of um although it wasn't I wouldn't claim signals was an op art gallery. There was something about technology and futurity and internationalism that was sort of in the air. I think um, and you know and, and so I think it was it's not it's an interesting movement in the sense that it looks. Dated. It looks like you can place op art squarely, and this this sort of you know this sort of style of Bridget Riley in the 60s, but it wasn't it wasn't in isolation. I, I think it existed as a as a as a, a tendency that had a relationship to pop and minimal and post minimal, you know, so, uh, and it was it reflected the way in which artists were working at, at the time. I think mm. I internationally as well. I think it, it seems to be part of a, a bigger cultural arena and I think um, one of the things I wanted to ask was this idea of a connection between op art and, and music there seems yeah. to be some some quite clear connections and yeah. the piece you have is sort of Frank Stella as jazz musician yeah. referenced by you know, Jerry Ron Morton and yeah. Bridget Riley's work which is referenced in um, the Ellison Marine film of yeah. the of the 1968 yeah. about the Beatles is those sort of surreal psychedelic yeah nature that transcends um, from the painted image to, to a broader yeah. musical and film culture and yeah. poss possibly talk about some of the perhaps musical connections that uh, exist. Yeah. I, mean the lot, I think the lot, I think it, it does, um, I mean um, b b b b there's a Bridget Riley painting on the cover of the, um, is it the kind of Faust, is, is it the mm -hmm. kind of first kind of Faust LP? Um, and I, I mean, I think there's, there's something about, you know, there's something very graphically in media, the sort of a visual repetition, the sort of dynamism, um, you know, op optical play that makes it, um, you know, and people like S Steve Reich and ser sort of s serial music, you know, a very sort of refined sort of use of repetition that you can see, 
visually expressed in optical art, in 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 up art, that obsessive you know re repetition and then slight sort of deviation from um, from an order to create visual distortion and v visual effects and minimal music, I think. Um, but you know, I think there is there is a, there's certainly a relationship. I think someone like Jim Lambie. I mean, I think you can see it's the floor installation. Mm. Jim Lambie, you know, he's he's um, he's a sort of much he's a much later artist. He's probably you know young. He's not young. He's probably about my age, I think, probably. But um, um, but he's 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 a Glasgow artist, um, and he he was. I mean, a lot of his works draw really on. The music culture and style culture use sort of safety pins and glitter and vinyl tape, mm -hmm. vinyl records. It uses sort of, sort of eye popping colour. The works are titled after punk and post punk so so songs. So there's something about psychedelic culture and do it yourself culture and you know. Um, and he also he's a musician. I mean he was in um, he was in a band called uh, the Boy Hairdressers, um, which is an early incarnation of teenage of of, of of teenage of teenage fan club. So. I think there's there's a sense in which you know artists. I mean, I think this probably goes back to people like Robert Fraser. I mean, there's you've got the um, you can see the the the, 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 the Br 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 Bridget Riley plexiglass uh, prints would have been shown at Robert Fraser Gallery in the 1960s. Robert Fraser was you know he was um, he opened the gallery in, in 1962 and he was Groovy Bob. He was somebody who was um, one of the most important you know, legendary art dealers in post-war Britain. Um, he introduced people like Jim Dine and Jim, uh, exhibited Peter Blake, Klaus Oldenburg, um, Bridget Riley also, um, R R uh, Richard, Richard, ha Richard, ha Richard Hamilton, but he was somebody who really bridged the, the sort of rock music world. He was selling Magritte works to Paul McCartney. He was hanging out with the Rolling Stones. He was that famous painting of, of Richard Hamilton, where he's, um, you can see Mick Jagger handcuffed to Robert Fraser in the back of a police car after, after they've been kind of busted. Okay. And so I think there's something about that flattening of hierarchies between music and fashion and lifestyle and fine art that was really, I think, op art is sort of part of this picture, I think. Mm, definitely. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, you mentioned earlier about the kinetic art and being of a space age um, sort of thought process. And I was wondering how that perhaps transcended into some of the materials that they use. So you have quite a, uh, in, the, in the show itself, there's quite a range of materials and processes. Um, is it discuss, is possible to discuss some of the material processes and the themes that perhaps are connected to our part? The themes in terms of how, and to the, the media? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think, I suppose it's sort of a, like a plastic, a plastic age. I think I don't, I've not, I mean, I'm just, just thinking laterally. I think what you can see in the upper art display are, is I guess it's mostly going to be plastic based paints. There's something about that. So it's, it's moving away from easel, easel painting um, and wanting this thing about the acceleration of the way, you know, the work needs to be sort of made in, in a very sort of plastic, immediate, you know, non-expressive sort of way. Mm. So the work I think you mentioned is um, it's the Craig Kaufman. It's, right. it's, um, yeah. it's a sort of um, he's again he's a sort of ca ca Californian, a Californian artist, um, op artist, not 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 an op. He's sort of post minimal artist, not an op, an op artist, but it's um, it's a, a vacuum formed object, sort of plastic and j plastic and texture molded. There's something very sort of sensuous and um, visceral and corporeal. I think about about that about about that w about uh, about that w work. And I think you know this, the artists like you know um, the use the use of l l l light and Larry Bell um, and Californian light and space art of the 1960s. I think there was something about artists but wanting to to move away from using like oil paint. And use have the work somehow take on a more machine-made look. So using acrylic paints and plastics, um, the Paul Bruno sort of kinetic art using light. I mean, I think we could have. It's a shame we didn't have things like Otto Pena and sort of art, you know, actual 
light art, I think, would have, which was also a very um, r r related tendency in the 1960s. But I think it just reflected the technology of the age, I think, and the optimism of the age, I think. So you, you wouldn't say it was a sort of anti-art movement, an anti-painting movement, which just, just happened to be uh, embracing the technology of the time? I think so, yeah, yeah. Than, rather than specifically trying to uh, move away from painting per se. Yeah, I think, well, I think it wasn't, I mean, I think op art, it's, it's not, it's not um, although Bridget Raleigh is a painter, um, I think it was a reaction against the previous generation, you know, things like, like the like the Gazero group, got Heinz Mack, um, Paul Burberry, um, Walter LeBlanc, who were this, it, w it was a movement that was founded in Germany in 1958, and they wanted the word to have no content, it was kind of zero, you know, that year, zero, they could avoid, mm. um, that created, that, that, had, that had no, that had no p p pictorial expression, um, which is the opposite of what you can see, you know, in the 1950s with, with artists like Mark Rothko and that, you know, that some expression of inner turmoil, the inner sort of, um, you know, a sp sp spiritual struggle, I think, or, you know, so I think it's, um, it was, I think, a reaction against the previous generation, like most movements, I think, like pop art was a, a reaction against the austerity of the 1950s. It was sort of, you know, this new, new beginning, I think. Okay. Um. In terms of some new beginnings, uh, I'm wondering if, if you could perhaps contextualise perhaps our part or the influences of our part in today's um, today's realm in, in relation to um, how it sits within a contemporary contemporary culture. I'm um, thinking possibly not just in terms of mechanisation and automation, but also in terms of um, looking at the a con conceptual notion of space whether that's through VR or whether it's through projections on t onto buildings which are mm. in, in some senses replicating that um, distortion of, of perspective and looking mm. at things in a slightly different optical way. Mm. Um, could you see a resonance of our part in today's artwork? Um, I tried to, I mean, I think it's, it, I mean, I, I, as I was, I think our part is, um, it's a it's a it's a st it's a style effect, and I think it was I, I, I think of it as being, as I mean I think there's there's something about it being sort of time capsuled, um, and it's it's very it's it's it's, it's odd. I think the, 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 the there's always a sort of a l lag between a movement like the 19s, you know, op art and pop pop art too. In the 1960s, and it being very much you know. Pop art is also to time capsuled, I think, in in in, in, in some ways, and then try and then it it, it, it takes time, I think, for it to, 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 to be rediscovered in a postmodern sort of way. Mm. So I think what you can see in this play is artists like Angela Bullock, who's sort of Ameri is an American uh, sculptor, um, and they're sort of pixel cubes. I mean, they're sort of it's it, it's a sculptural installation. Um, so it's an after effect, I think. It is, I mean, I don't, I don't, it's difficult to sort of say that op art, you know, I think at, at the time you can say it's a revolution in p p p p perception. I think it somehow was, um, you know, it, it had a, a kind of a charge and excitement, um, you know, and then, you know, and I suppose the end of the 60s and the 1970s and austerity and Nixon still in power and the war still going on and all these utopian ideals haven't materialized um and it feels like op art was um it's a f it's a it's 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 it's, it, it, uh, it's a cul-de-sac i think um st stylistically um but i think you can certainly see it. i mean artists like jim lanby his work makes a lot of sense i think yeah, um in the context although it's, it's a contemporary work it's um if, if, if you if you see the installation essentially it's um it's installed um afresh every time um, you know, it's in the tape collection, um, and essentially, it's a tape. You, you it's it's uh, vinyl tape, which f which follows the shape of the room, and it's sort of it's con concentrically sort of. Um, it's essentially, it, 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 it fills a tape. You know, I think you probably you probably see the, the, the image, but it, it, it it it's its installation is site specific, depending on depending on on, uh, on the room. Um, but what you can see in Liverpool is that because it, it, we have these co these sort of co these columns, you can't really see, you can't see it. This is, this is actually from when it was installed in Colour Chart, a tape Liverpool a few years ago. 
but it's on the second floor, so you know the columns that you have in the gallery. It creates these um, these sort of weird sort of cup. It's, it's 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 like just standing on a floor which is visually unstable, and it's quite you know um, disturbing actually. I think, mm. um, but it's a good it's it's a great installation. But essentially, it's it's individual strips of tape. So it took uh, a week to install, and it took eight people. Like um, and, and so it's a quite it's a it's quite a feat to to, to, to install. But I think it's one manifestation of how our part still has um, a, a charge. It can be appropriated as a style that has a meaning, I think, by the artists in the now, I think. I mean, I think in that, in that sense, it's almost timeless because it, it doesn't transcend, let's say, to... Yeah. to or it'll, be, it'll be attached to a particular period yeah. in, that, in that way. Yeah. Um, I've one more question, really, um, is that um, I'm wondering... My, my sort of background is, is film and animation. And our part is very much about the illusion of, of movements, about mm. colour and abstraction, and to duration as much as movement, mm. I suppose. Uh, and I'm wondering whether there's any, do you know any, any films made by these artists that actually were moving images rather than just static? Um, you've obviously you've got the kinetic art, which has yeah. some movement towards it, but whether there's any film. Yeah. You've had, sort of pre that, you had sort of Hans Richter and all those yeah. kinds of films which were explore slightly different things and yeah. later on we had structural materials film which yeah. again played with perhaps negative and positive spaces yeah. and, and exploring the nature of film and yeah. in, a, in, a, in a visual way. Yeah. I, d I wonder if you knew any uh, any artists that, that did something similar with perhaps Albers, did, did Albers make any film? I don't think so, um, I d I, he, he wasn't a filmmaker but I think it's, um, but there's definitely, there's something about psychedelic like Psychedelic film and Judd Yelkup and Harry Smith and those artists who were using, you know, um, I think there was it was definitely um, ha this sort of like retinal sort of experimentation, optical effects. Um, they did have an effect in f f funny thing in, in the nineteen sixties and, and as you said earlier, that people like Norman McLaren and yeah. Len Lai, mm. which you know, which is really which is really m m much earlier. We were, we were really ha harnessing. Um, the op optical effects using film and fast cutting and e um, editing. Paul Sharitz as well, is yeah. a, which is I interesting. Um, it's actually sort of re you know, sort of reordering celluloid. So it's 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 completely. I mean, it's sort of it's not. I'm not sure it's opt it's op -op, but it's certainly aggressive, mm. uh, epilepsy inducing sort of um, <laughs> f um, f f film. But it's which is what sort of early. That's still sort of sixties. I think this. Mm. I think. Um, but then also, I think there's something about computer art as well, and L Lillian Schwartz and people oh yeah, who were sort of, yeah, from the, uh, sort of, yeah, artists. I mean, that was art and tech, Bell and art, mm -hmm. precisely, yeah, optical. I mean, I think it's um, Bell Labs, and I think oh there's sort of, yeah, the sort of collaboration between artists and technology in the 1960s. And I think it's not unrelated to our part. I think it's art. You know, I think it would have been artists like Stan Van der Beek and all these artists, and um, who were, who were making you were using c using computers i think in a very at the very beginning you know of them being h harnessable in some ways to create like imagery mm. um but those films are, are still just being rediscovered now i mean i was i was, I was in new york um the other week and, and there was they had um lillian schwartz's uh film in a display it, it was really a, a display called programmed and it was about about the relationship bet between computers and algorithms and seriality and um, rules-based composition. Mm. So it's solar wit and minimal art and, you know, sort of... Um, but it also had people like Namjoon Paik and Joseph Albers uh, um, yeah. as well. So there's some... I think it's being reframed, I think. I think it's always more useful, I think, rather than thinking about op art as being... A f uh, as being um, style in the 60s if you break uh, if you break the sort of the, the canon the sense in which actually you can link it to computer art and minimal art and minimal music and different sort of so different scenes and con you know sort of um, tendencies which may not have been actually at the time even recognized um, I think that's what that's that's how you that, that's how you create new meaning. I think. Because mm. no. I, I, I just a thought because it's largely about whether it's about c 
colour and, and line and, f and space, but it's also about systems and systems and structures, and, yeah. and that perhaps connects some of those things we've talked about in terms of music and film yeah. and computers. Is those that inherent nature yeah. of, of systems and structures that runs through yeah. all those things? There's, there's something about you know about instability as well. There's something about this, uh, the l lack of certainty, I think, and. Um, you know this sense in which you know you could say that Rothko's color field paintings express the is this inner truth, this sort of thing that which is t tangible. And I think I'm just going to read this quote from Bridget Riley. I think there's a time when meanings were focused and a reality co could be fixed, and when that sort of belief disappeared and things became uncertain and open to, to, in to, to interpretation, it creates like instability and that kind of visual instability, mm. I think is what she was trying to capture, the sense in which, it, you know, and I think she always, Bridget Riley was always somebody who thought that the work is completed by perceptual interaction, the meaning is created between, you know, the work and you seeing the work and, you know, it's not, um, it's a, you know, the meaning, is, it's sort of completed, I think is what's at the, um, Perception is the is is the meaning, it, you know, itself rather than r rather than the, the work itself. Mm -hmm. So I think it's um, that insta that open-handed instability, um, that democratic sense in which the, the meaning is created by your lived p p perception of, of of the work. I think is uh, it's why it's still important. I think. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I think this point would to to offer it out to the audience and. Uh, any questions from from to the microphone? Just a semi question, semi comment to continue Alex cinematographic perspective. But somehow I find interesting that all part in a sense we can relate it to some early uh, abstract films like Hans Richter, for instance, uh, Rhythm yeah, 21, yeah. 23, or Oscar Fischinger's yeah. geometric animations that precede all part with yeah. 30, 40 years. Yeah. And later somehow in our collective cinematic imagination probably we have Hitchcock's Vertigo yeah. or Kubrick's Space Odyssey or even if yeah. you want Big Lebowski. So can we think of all part as some kind of cinematic intertext? I think so. <laughs> 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 Alex, yeah. It's more for Alex, probably. I think so, yeah. <laughs> I think so, yes, but yeah, Alex. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I, think, I think it probably is. It, it's, it's, it's within that realm. It's, uh, I, I couldn't think of any, any op artists who'd done any films, and that was kind of a question to Dan, mm. really. Uh, I can see a thing of pe things afterwards and before it, but I couldn't think of anything precisely that was that's linked to it directly. Because mm. um, it, it is about. A lot of the things you've mentioned, really, are exploration of, of colour and, and line and uh, within the frame, but also that, that relationship with the viewer mm. and how, how it breaks the perspective and looks at, at, at sort of the, the space within the frame just through those mechanisms. And I, I, I guess our part fits in quite well with yeah. all those things. Yeah. It's sort of mechanised optics. I mm. think it's, I mean, that's the same in the painting, but it's something like. Duchamp's rotor reliefs. I mean, that's really like quite, quite early, but there's something about, you know, that sort of sense, you know, but there's something about op optics being somehow mechanized and made mechanical, I think, I think is, um, is what you can see in early film too, I think. Mm. Yeah. Question then. Gestalt theory, yeah. Um, I think so, I think so, I think so. I think it's um, I think it's I think of that as being linked to m minimal. I think Robert Morris was it w w was interested in the um, in 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 Gestalt theory. Somehow that um, you could create. I, I suppose it's like um, through m minimal m means you create a greater psychological uh, um, uh, uh, effect. I mean, there's something certainly that you have to, you 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 have to experience a Bridget Riley painting in, in the flesh. 
and it's the it, it's a physiological uh, a, 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 a response, and I think it's um, it, the, the, it's it's work, it's work that doesn't really, although it, although it, it was manifest in you know in, in applied arts and um, and maybe it's you know not taken as it wasn't taken as seriously at the time. I think the Bridget Riley painting uh, Late Morning, which is the big the first work in the show, it is quite it, it, the, uh, the effect because it's 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 a, a large scale sixties canvas. Um, it is. It does. It's quite a disturbing, you know, f physiological f um, effect, and I think that was intentional. I think art, I mean uh, the artists were very much interested in color theory and the psychology of perception. I think. I mean, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't just a style effect. It, it was. It, it was something more um, psychologically charged. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite. Um, yeah, it's great. No, it's great. I mean, I didn't. Um, it it did it did something. I think having the column. I mean, I think it wasn't. It's like it's like standing on the sea. I think somehow because it's because of the sort of the, the turbulence. And I didn't quite expect it to be quite as powerful. Um, but it's a simple. It's a it's 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 it's, it's um, I suppose it's the epitome of a, a Gestalt theory. But it's 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 a very very simple. Through simple repetition, it creates, you know, it's an, the accumulation of a sort of a, of a of a, um, a simple artistic gesture becomes something more than the sum of more than the sum of of, a, uh, of its parts. So yeah. yeah. There's a question at the. Uh yeah, you you sort of answered this very much in the sixties. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you also bookended it the other end with Dazzle. Yes. Yeah. I think you suggested the response to the First World War. Yeah. But presumably this must have existed before the First World War for Dazzle to be used as a more be a passive weapon. Yeah. Um, I assume you yeah. and the take were part responsible for the delivery of one of the ferries. I wasn't involved, but I think, I mean, I wasn't so involved in, in that, but I think I would have, I mean, I suppose it's, um, it's, it's the futurist, isn't it? It's the vorticist movement, and I think it's does look like it's like um, it's an application. It's um, it, it, it's using visual distortion effect, you know, in a very in a military c context. So I think, you know, as we know, the futurists um, they had um, uh, they were very uh, enamoured. I think they had a sort of a, they had a, they they uh, championed this sort of mechanized aesthetic I think they were you know they sort of um you know they sort of believed in the sort of machine aesthetic to, to the point that they, um and it was a kind of fetish a, a, a kind of a cult almost um so I mean I, I think you can see a little bit of that in the in the leisure show there was there was a time when you know I, this machine aesthetic that I think is includes things like a dazzle and you know these sort of um the sort of Hard edge, aggressive as aesthetic that you can see um, in the work of the vorticists. I think is um, I'm, 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 I'm getting a bit confused here. I think. Well, I think yeah. It's sort of reflected in music as well at that time yeah. with Stravinsky. Yeah. 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 That same kind of almost uh, heavy aggressive. Yeah. Whatever it's, it's probably. I mean, I, I'm, I'm probably sort of r r r rambling a bit, but I think I don't. I mean, I think I was not wanting. Although I was, um, we were the show was called Op Art in Focus. It's not really Op Art, I don't think. The, 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 there are a few, 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 there are a few Op Art works, as they have has really a lot of writers. But I think it's more interesting to, to try to propose it to ha as having a more international outreach and also relationships to, 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 to earlier art forms. So I think, I mean, there was a Bridget Riley show at, at the Court Hall, I think, which included Seurat. And pointillism, and so I think it, wa you know, she really wants. I think she's. I think it's more useful, interesting. I think probably for the audience, and also in, in terms of how we understand why her work is still interesting and still has, you know, a, a resonance. There's going to be a big show at the Hayward, I think, next year. Um, you know, why or, or this year? No, it's ne it's in June of, 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 of next year. It's more interesting to think about how do we, where does this 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 the tendency fit? You know, in the long tail of official culture, so I think vorticism and 
Dazzle and Wadsworth. I think that's that's a sort of a long sort of pre effect, I think, of optical art. So. Thank you for this very engaging discussion, Darren and Alex. Uh, my question's for Darren. Um, Hi, Michelle. About the curational process for, for, for this exhibition. So why up out now, or what was the trigger? Because I understand curating something like this is probably quite complex. Yeah. So what was the trigger point, and how, how, how the exhibition came together? Uh, well, it, it, it's a collection display. I mean, I think all the works I've drawn from the Tate collection, um, it sits in the end focus. I mean, I think it's, I'm going to be a bit institutional here, but I think it's, um, Tate has been, um, we've been organising in focus displays for a few years. So there's Matisse in focus, and then there is Liechtenstein in focus, there's Trace Yemen and Blake in focus. So I think it's, um, it's one, I mean, I think op art has, it sort of has, um, it's very, it, it, it's a very accessible style. I don't think you can say that it's not, um, it's not, it's not c conceptual art in, in focus. It's, 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 focus. I mean, my, um, my, uh, my area is, is, is 1960s pop and minimal art. Um, and I think, I think initially we were looking at, I mean, I was, again, we wanted to do a Bridget Riley in focus, and then we, a lot of the works were out on loan, I, I, I actually, um, so we couldn't convene a core of works, um, and then we thought, well, let's, well, I think, but optical, there was a, clearly an appetite and a take that our part was a, an interesting thing to look at again. Um, so, and then I was, I mean, I think I was, what, what's I trying to explain, I think it's, it's 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 more it's more interesting cur cur curatorially to think about op art in relation to why how how has it had a m manifestation on l later art making, so the inclusion of, pe of people like Bridget Riley, um, Jim Lambie, and there's also a uh, like there's a Hearst um, dot painting. Damien Hearst is not an op artist, um, but there's something about you know, the work's being titled after pharmaceuticals and he's interested in categories and classifications, you know, pharmacy, you know, and kind of um, classifications bet between shells and objects and life and, d and uh, life and uh, life and death. Although the work, you know, clearly Hearst is not an op artist, but the work does have, it, m it makes formal sense and somehow a sort of metaphorical sense, I think, in relation to Jim Lambie's psychedelic flaw. Um, so that was a really, I wanted to sort of create, wanted to, wanted to um, I think I didn't want it to be completely time capsule. I mean, I can use it as this phrase, but I didn't want it to be st st stuck in the 60s. And in the, in the same way, you know, that somebody like Mondrian, he was a sort of, you know, sort of you know, still sort of, sort of abstract artist beginning of the 20th century. To me, his work, the way in which it influenced like Latin American art in the 50s and 60s is, is more interesting. That you link it, you, you, you link Mondrian to Ligia Clark and Helio Otisica. And the, you know, I think there's, um, and somebody, I don't know, I think there's some, I think just trying to sort of unpick these assumed notions that op art was just meaningful in the 60s and that's it. And actually, you can link it to Albers and Bauhaus and British constructivism and vorticism and futurism and you know ex ex experimental film and contemporary art um, you know and yeah I think I, I think that was what I was thinking I mean I th I, I'm hopefully I'm, I'm hoping it's a successful display but it's yeah just to follow on from that a little, I think um, it's worth mentioning that the, the spaces that you've created in, in that show yeah. uh, the sort of three main spaces yeah. you know like uh, they are they are all quite different as well. Yeah. So you, the, the first are in the larger room yeah. of the three, without the Bridget Riley's, uh, the main Bridget Riley one is, yeah. uh, has a very different feel to the other two, yeah. with or without the floor, I guess. Yeah. Um, is it possible just to explain a little bit about the process of how those things kind of 
fit together and what your sort of, what your sort of process was in, mm. in relation to curating the specific pieces mm. and how, how they kind of fit together. It was probably difficult to articulate, but I think it's, no, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's um, I mean, I, I don't know. I think it's. I think it's. I. I. I, I it's work. I, I normally will work on um, sight sight lines. I, I'm trying to create a sense of um, spatial balance between. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's lots of things. I think that could come into place when you do some works. I think it's um, the works need to be pr e every work needs to be respected and displayed in a way that is true, and doesn't undermine the work. Um, in a way, and I think you know, you've got to encourage the works to be sort of talking to 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 to, to, to each other, and not 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 competing. So, the idea of putting the Bridget Riley painting in the Jim Lambie room was never. I thought that was just like that would have been. I just would have destroyed the work. Actually, it ne it needs a, a little bit of space and a, li a, li a little bit of um, you know, respect, I think, in, in that way. Whereas I think um, the Vazarelli was, I think, was c competing and the Blinky Palermo too was, um, so I think, I mean, I think it was when we, when um, once you made the selection of w works and you, ha you know, and I was happy w with that, I think it, c it comes down to, um, it's just, I mean, I think it's, I mean, there's, there's two, th there's two things, as well as the historical reframing of Apart and being, you know, thinking about it in terms of art, in terms of art history and the canon, and expanding, sort of complicating that story and making it more international, including, you know, zero group artists and Jesus Soto and Shenzer and you know Middle Eastern arts, doing did, uh, adding things that you would not, issue, you know, you would not normally place in this in this in this um, in this sort of in this in, in this in, in this movement. But also wanting to um, to create a really good sh it's kind of sound a bit like Barnum, but I wanted to I wanted to be like a really good show. Mm -hmm. So you you you, you 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 walk in and you think everything looks amazing, and I want to I want to walk here, and you know, and it's the, the Angela Bullock room you know, work is given is, is given respect and space, and it's you know installed, and it's I think. I was a bit worried about actually when I was installing up art that it was a bit um, anal. Ev 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 everyone's very sort of l linear and geometric. The judge directly in the centre of, of the room, and I think I think it's probably quite intentional that I want to walk in, and everything has a sort of like a geometry, the symmetry between the works, the spatial orientation between the, the between the, 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 the kind of judge, the s centering of the Bridget Riley canvas. You know, you know it's all. It's probably a bit, you know, like, like uh, obvious, but overall, um, it's a combination of being, you know, art, art, you know, interesting curatorial art historically, new ways of presenting works in the Tate collection, but also making it, you know, it needs to feel like it's a fantastic show. And mm -hmm. I think about that for top the top floor show, the stage. I mean, it's, it's not it's not a very um, Fashionable thing to say, but the staging of exhibitions, I think, is really is really important. The sense of that momentous, so you walk in, you think, "Holy shit, this is really fantastic!" You know, and this is those are these, this is exactly why I came here. I wanted to see these works presented in a respectful, clean, impactful way, and that probably moves into the realm of spectacle. Um, but you know, we we I want the shows to be. Um, I, 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 I mean, I'm probably talking far too much about this aspect, but I think something about I knew Jim Lambie's floor would be Instagrammable, ac actually. And in in an age where budgets for f marketing shows is reduced, um, you know, so we're not, you know, we're not producing, you know, we're not producing as much. Um, we're not. We're not. We're not. Uh, uh, exhibitions. I mean, I'm not. I'm not uh, in the marketing team, but uh, exhibitions are not being promoted and propagated in the way that they were tw 20 years ago through print media, through advertising and through, you know, through the sort of more tri 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 traditional forms of m mediation. Nowadays, ev everybody's got, an in has got a phone. So I knew that um, something like Jim Lambie, when, we're, when the work is being really pushed to y young people and families, which are really an important part of Tate's, of Tate's audience, it, 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 it's important that you know the next generation of art lovers, and you know, feel comfortable, can, can come to take and experience something like kind of great art, free of charge. 
but I also knew that if you encourage people to take photos and to share them through social media, it's doing something for Tate as well. It's, it's marketing the shows and making it a place where you know we all want to, we all want it to, to be. And that's not that isn't a curator speaking. That's me talking as um, knowing that I think what we do is really important, and I wanted and, and I wanted it to be shared by any means possible. It's quite liberating going to the show and being able to take photographs for free yeah. as well. Yeah, so no, it's imp it's important. I mean, it's 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 the national c it's national collection, so that's um and that's a blanket, you know, we that we 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 encourage that. And actually, the one thing that we're doing uh, next year, we're doing we're doing a, an, an, a show of uh, of Keith Haring, who's the, the first you know sort of um sort of 1980s graffiti artist um, whose work is complete, completely ubiquitous on social media. And I think it's very important that we've got an approval from the estate of Keith Haring that we will allow photography in the show. And we'll definitely encourage that, I think, because it'll be another way of um, maximising uh, the effect, I think. Any more questions from the floor? In which case, uh, I think, uh, thank, thank you very much, Darren. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.